I'll just keep playing with it. I will tell you ten okay. minutes before. So uh, the last talk is task and motion planning, and our um, speaker is Karen Garrett uh, from uh, MIT. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Kaylin Garrett. I'm a fifth year PhD student at MIT in the Learning Intelligence Systems Group, advised by Leslie Cabling and Tomas Lazana Prez. So today I'm going to talk about integrating classical planning, which you saw this morning, with robotic planning. And the overall agenda we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of review, not so much on classical planning because you've seen it today. Then we're going to talk about different types of hybrid planning, so planning with continuous and discrete variables. Then we're going to get into task and motion planning and we'll describe our approach for trying to frame the problem and also solve these instances. And if we have time, we'll talk about extensions to temporal planning, multi-agent planning, and TAMP under uncertainty. So our goal is to develop the algorithms that allow robots to autonomously reason about uh, complex human environments. And these are environments in which things are sort of semi-structured, where you may know the type of objects they're around, you may know that there's a kitchen, you may know the joints each drawer have, but you might know the ex not know the exact configuration of the task and you might have varying goal conditions of what to do. For instance, for this Boston Dynamics video, you might have a goal to clean up the whole uh, sink, or you might have a goal to actually retrieve a bunch of packages, and you have to figure out which robots are best suited to do that based on which ones are closest. Uh, trying to prepare food is very interesting because it has a lot of dynamic and dexterous manipulations to it. And additionally, one could think about trying to apply these algorithms to construction-like tasks. So all these tasks require both planning high-level decisions for what the robot should do, as well as ultimately torques to command to the controllers to execute them. And so these problems are inherently in a factored space, which there are many different objects that many different objects and variables that have different state and can change independently. And each of these spaces may be continuous or discrete. So for our robot moving around a human world, continuous variables are involved the, cur the current robot configuration, the poses of the objects, the joint positions of the doors. While discrete variables could be whether something's on something else, whether something's in the hand of the robot, whether something is holding water currently, is something cooked? And we'd like to be able to develop algorithms that can plan for a very diverse set of manipulations, such as movement ones, picking, pouring, scooping, pushing, uh, detecting as well. So here's an example instance of what we'd like to be able to plan for. So for this task, the goal of the, ro of the robot is to uh, serve a meal. And it does that by cooking the broccoli, which is this green block. Uh, and to cook it, it has to place it on the stove on the right, uh, a very expensive stove, uh, and then press the button to turn it on and cook it. And once it's cooked, it can then serve it to the human. And so if you notice at the start, um, the block actually starts on the right side of the robot, and it's only accessible via the right arm. And so the robot actually automatically plans to move the object to the middle so the left arm can pick it up and then place it on the stove. And that all came up naturally through the plan. Here's another task where the goal is to serve the broccoli and also the water to the human. And here, it needs to put them both on the plate. And doing so requires actually choosing a placement such that they don't collide. Otherwise, maybe you would spill the water of the cup. Here's another example where we're trying to actually stack a tower. And so in this case, the goal conditions are that one green block be on one purple block and one green block be on another green block. And so naturally, the only way of doing this is to make a tower of three objects. And so this is a very standard PDL style domain that actually is in the real world because we're trying to choose placements that are stable and also avoid stacking things in ways that would cause the robot to collide with the tower. And so here's a final one of a stacking task requiring stacking the cup on the uh, green block instead. And we can also reason about tasks involving things like cooking coffee. And so here we have a little bit more dynamic skills where we have pouring and we also have scooping and stirring. So one thing to note when you're scooping and you're uh, transporting a cup to pour is that you have to keep the orientation about upright, otherwise the material will fall out. And so that constraint is automatically incorporated within the robot's motion planner to ensure that it doesn't actually spill any particles while it's actually planning its motions. And finally, here's another example that's just very different than the ones we've seen so far. Um, this is one where, motivated by architectural applications, where they're hoping to 3D print structures in space by using a robot arm to extrude plastic in air. And what they have is a model of what they'd like to build, but what they don't have is actually a safe plan for doing so. Uh, you need to consider the fact that the robot might actually collide with the tower itself and destroy the structure as it's planning. Maybe you choose an assignment that actually isn't actually stable and it falls over. Maybe you choose one that's not stiff and it deforms and bends. And so all of these constraints actually need to be taken into account to actually plan a successful trajectory to build this structure. So the problem class we're going to deal with today is going to make some assumptions. So to start with, we're going to assume that problems are discrete time. 
meaning that to solve them, you have to only use a finite number of decisions. These decisions can be uh, parameterized by continuous variables. So it could be something like um, follow this trajectory, which has 10 waypoints in it. We're going to assume things are deterministic for now. So our actions always have our intended effects. We're going to assume the state's observable, so we can actually see everything about the world. But really what we're going to focus on is this hybrid aspect, the fact that we're in this continuous and discrete uh, state space. So naturally, as one of my guess, uh, this work builds on task planning, which is typically called classical planning in the ICAPS community, and, and motion planning. Uh, I won't go through too much of task planning because you've seen it earlier today, but really the key thing is that we want, we want to plan in a very large discrete space with many variables. And we think that the state space is actually intractable to write down due to the Cartesian products of all the values that could be taken by the variables. Many of these tasks are represented in factored action languages, such as strips or PDDL. And really, these languages allow you to represent the state as a set of facts that are true about the world. So things like, is this object on something else? Is something in the hand? And then actions are typically described in a precondition and effect model, where preconditions test whether an action is valid at a current state, and effects uh, modify the state. And as you saw this morning, these fact representations are really nice because they allow you to design much more influential and interesting algorithms than just breadth first search. You can start to take advantage of relaxations of planning problems to estimate distance heuristics, for, for instance. You can apply SAT solvers and take advantage of the factoring of constraints. I will go into motion planning a little bit more, just to ensure that we're all on the same page. Uh, so to start with, I'll go over some terminology, which might be useful. So I'll talk about these frequently. Um, so this, the first one is a pose. So a pose describes the location of an object in the world and includes the position of the object and the orientation. And so position is just x, y, z. And the orientation are rotations about each axis. So maybe roll pitch yaw of a plane, for instance. A configuration is the set of values of the robot's degrees of freedom. Um, so these can be base values. So if the robot's uh, moving on the floor, it might be able to move an x, y, and yaw. And if we're trying to command a robot arm, maybe you actually can move all of its straight angles at once and actually explore much higher dimensional space. A trajectory will be a sequence of robot configurations. A grasp is a relative pose between the robot's gripper and an object it wants to manipulate, such that if the uh, gripper is at that relative transformation, then it can attach itself to the object rigidly, and then carry it, for instance. And inverse kinematics is a robot procedure that tries to find a configuration that's able to reach a given pose for instance, to actually decide where to stand to pick up an object. Motion planning is the problem of trying to find a path from our initial configuration of the robot to a goal configuration that avoids obstacles and also adheres to things like joint limits or maybe even orientation constraints on its gripper. Really, the key attribute about these problems are that they're inherently continuous, that you are a continuous point searching through the space. And oftentimes, these configuration spaces are pretty high dimensional. That Sometimes we do care about planning for the base, which might be in x, y, theta, but oftentimes we, play, we care, about, care about planning for robot arms, which maybe have seven joints, or maybe more. There are three different types of ways of solving these problems. The first is to do a geometric decomposition of the problem. Uh, these were pretty popular in the 70s, but don't scale as well as the configuration space gets more, uh, gets larger and higher dimensional. Um, and so that motivates actually using sampling-based methods and optimization-based methods, which I'll discuss briefly. Uh, let's say above seven, six or seven above. Uh, but if you're planning for like uh, the Atlas robot, then it can get like in the 30s or something. Well, like a 60 degree robot arm, you can still do with geometry. Uh, not really, no. It, it's much more difficult. I think you max out at like four degrees of freedom, and not many robots have just four. <laughs> it's just that the kind of trying to discretize the space gets much more difficult, essentially. That if you think about each axis having maybe two configurations of discretization, then you start to get to 2 to the 3, and you know, 2 to the 5, and 2 to the 32, and then it gets kind of hard to explore the whole space. Yeah. So one key insight in motion planning is that you can take this problem of trying to plan safe motions for a robot arm and reduce it to a point, which is really useful for developing algorithms. And by doing this, you transform its workspace, so the place where it actually lives, and in this case, the robot's this triangle that's able to uh, move in x, y, theta, and you reduce it to planning through a configuration space. And so in the configuration space, the robot's represented by a point. As you can see, the point can move in x, y, theta, and the objects are actually inflated. So basically, you can take the robot's geometry and warp it around the objects and get all of the positions where if the robot were at that point, it would collide and be unsafe. 
And this really is nice because they can simplify the problem to just planning for a single point rather than two complicated geometric bodies. Sampling-based motion planning actually goes further. Um, it's able to leverage the fact that you plan for a point quite directly. So here, sampling-based motion planning methods actually approach these problems by trying to discretize the configuration space by sampling uniformly at random, or maybe deterministically as well, and then try to implicitly represent whether the point is in the collision-free configuration space by calling a collision checker. So maybe ODE or FCL, basically just set the robot at some configuration and then see if something's in collision. And this is great because this abstracts away the whole geometry of the scene. That your robot, your robot might be very complicated, your world very detailed, but it doesn't matter for your algorithm. All it has to do is compute this query, and then it can be correct. Um, yeah, and so basically you're implicitly representing a configuration space. And if you want to check whether a path between two configurations, for instance, is safe, essentially you just step along that path, as shown on the right, and if you hit a point which is in collision, in this case represented by the gray obstacle, then it's no longer a safe connection between these configurations. Uh, three of the main types of algorithms for these problem classes are probabilistic road maps and RRTs. I'm going to focus just on probabilistic road maps, PRMs, for now, and I think they're sufficient for understanding the general gist of these methods, and also understanding how they relate to task and motion planning a little bit later. So here's our motion planning problem. We start off at this initial configuration in green, we want to get to this goal configuration in red, and we can't move for these obstacles. So the first thing the PRM does is it just samples the space, and let's say uniformly at random here, and so now we have a bunch of configurations. Some of these clearly are not even viable, right? They're in the obstacles themselves, and so they're all checked for collisions, and the ones that collide are pruned. Now, we investigate each vertex, and we actually try to understand uh, what are its local neighbors? What could we move through that's not too far away? Then among those connections, we check each of these edges by stepping along them incrementally and figure out which ones are actually colliding with the obstacles themselves. And then we can remove that set. Once we do this for all of the configurations, we end up with a graph, a roadmap. And this is great because then we have reduced this uh, complicated continuous problem to a discrete problem where we can apply standard graph search techniques to solve it. And we can uh, identify the shortest path by calling Dijkstra or something. And maybe a key thing to kind of point out about the impact of dimensionality in this space, um, these algorithms work really, really well when there are a large set of solutions. And so if you have a very high dimensional space, but it turns out there are many ways you could have actually solved it, then it will only take a few samples to actually find a path. However, if it's very constrained, then they'll perform poorly. And I'll show an example of that in a couple slides. So the most expensive operation in this whole process is still collision checking. That in general, our robots are very complicated. Consider this arm on a sideway base and this decomposition into convex parts. You have to check all those parts with all the entities in your world. And if you're operating in like a kitchen, then that might be really expensive. But at the same time, by only calling like a off the shelf video game collision checker, you are saving some effort of trying to directly understand if things are in contact yourself. And in order to actually ensure that our motions are safe, if we're planning in the real world, we have to use a very fine resolution to check each of these segments. And so again, this takes up a lot of time. And if we're trying to make a roadmap with many edges, this might take tens to twenties of seconds. And that seems you know, too expensive for trying to plan one motion, for instance. This motivates a field of motion planning called lazy motion planning. And the idea here is that if you look at this path we found, it only involves a few set of edges in the whole graph that many of them there are completely unrelevant to like finding a good path. Like this whole subgraph over here just kind of wanders off in the wrong direction. Why do we want to actually validate if those are collision free if they're not helping us achieve our goal? And so the way that motion, lazy motion planning goes around this is to optimistically plan without collisions to start with. And then once you found a candidate path, then check it for collisions. And if there are no collisions, then you, you've just succeeded uh, in one iteration. If there are, then you remove those edges from the roadmap and you continue. And so this is an example of this exact process. So we construct our PRM as before, except for we're not going to prune any edges or vertices yet. We solve for the shortest path. We get this path here. But clearly, uh, one of the vertices actually is in collision with the obstacle. And so we can't actually return that, and so we delete it from the graph. OK, so we have a new graph now. We can solve it again. Let's say we get this path. OK, so the vertices now are not in collision, which is good. However, as we check the edges themselves, it turns out that this middle one is colliding still. And so we have to repeat. We can keep the one that we haven't proved to be in collision around, though, which is nice. 
And so let's say we find another path then. Okay, now we try to check it, and we increase the resolution for safety, and it turns out this path is actually collision free. And so now we have a solution. And the key thing here is that we're able to find the solution without evaluating two of the edges. With the PRM strategy, we would have had to do them all up front, and we would have lost some computational time due to doing needless evaluations. And this Yeah, so there are some theoretical results about um, given how much clearance you have for your solution, like how far away, like what's the minimum distance that you can get to the edges or get to the obstacles that can guide the step size of these things. And so you can't actually prove it's safe. In practice, people just kind of choose a resolution that seems appropriate for them. So, but you're totally right that there might be like a line right here that you just went through. And so you have to be careful and understand the properties of your domain. In practice, though, I haven't had that happen too much. Yeah. Why not do polygon overlap? So in 2D, you can do that. Um, and then you can like compute the sweat volume of a polygon moving along this edge. Uh, it's harder to do with 3D geometries. But 2D, that's actually what people do to exactly prove that something is not in collision. It's a good point. Yep, and so just to repeat this whole process, because this is a key point of my talk and actually applies to a lot of task motion planning algorithms as well. The idea is to defer collision checking until you've found a candidate plan. Once you've found one, you check all the collisions in that plan. If you have no collisions, you return a solution. Otherwise, you uh, remove those edges from the graph and repeat. And eventually, you'll either converge to the shortest path or you'll prove the problem is infeasible. And the nice thing, again, is the big savings in terms of the number of edges you check. And so with the normal PRM I showed you, you'd have to check all of these edges in this roadmap to start with. With a slightly better version, you can check only the edges that you explore in a forward search. And so when starting here, you may explore this part of the space. But that still is 77 checks. While with this lazy strategy, you only need 23. And so you really do save a lot of time. And this makes a lot of sense in very high dimensional robotic planning domains, such as table manipulation, where you could access a very large set of the workspace, but most of it might be irrelevant to your task. Like, there's no reason to move over here if you're just trying to pick like this. And so trying to validate whether that part of the space is collision-free is just wasted. So really quickly, I'll discuss some theoretical properties of these algorithms. Um, they're, they're a little bit disappointing if you come from like a classical like theory background because they don't have very strong properties. First, many of these algorithms can't actually prove infeasibility at all. That to sample some set and actually prove there's no path requires actually enumerating the full set. And we're planning a continuous space, which is uncountably infinite. And so there's no hope that we could actually cover all those points and prove that something doesn't exist. Even worse, these algorithms don't even necessarily uh, return a plan for some feasible problems. So let's say that we're in this problem right here, where the uh, goal is to go from this point to this goal set. And there's this very narrow passage, which in this case is exactly the width of the robot. The only way of navigating through that passage is to sample points that are on this horizontal line. That's the only solution that you can get. Um, however, because we're sampling this space, let's say, uniformly at random uh, from 2D, there's zero probability that we'll ever actually get a sample on that line. There's no probability mass. And so there's hopeless for trying to find a solution. And so this is an example of one in which, really, because the set of solutions is so small, these algorithms are not effective. And you can even relax this a little bit and inflate, or decrease these sizes a little bit. And it'll be complete, but it'll take a very long time to actually sample because of the very small solution set. And so these algorithms are only really effective when the problem is actually robust. And here, robustness means that a problem is robust when there exists a plan that can be locally perturbed and everything remains a solution. So if we had a little bit of wiggle room, or even a lot of wiggle room on this plan, then we actually would have a chance of solving it, and maybe even solving it quickly. And so. In terms of our algorithms, we then want uh, algorithms that can solve robustly feasible problems. And we'll be happy if the algorithms are probabilistically complete, which means that with probability one, they'll solve the problem in a finite amount of time. And really, what that translates to is that you could have a very bad set of coin flips um, that doesn't actually put the samples in the appropriate sets. But that has zero probability of actually happening. So almost surely, you will find a plan within some time, which is good. And in practice, that you know, the probabilistic part of it isn't a big deal, honestly. Really quickly, I'll talk about trajectory optimization. So another technique for addressing problems in high-dimensional 
configuration spaces is to formulate them as a non-convex constrained optimization problem. And so here we have this mathematical program where our goal is to minimize some sort of function, which might be a function of distance or control effort, subject to some inequality constraints, inequality constraints on a bunch of sampled uh, configuration waypoints. And so these constraints might encompass things like uh, joint limits, torque limits, but also more significantly uh, collision constraints. And so you can frame collisions themselves uh, or penetration of objects as a uh, inequality constraint and try to minimize it. And these solvers generally aren't able to prove that they got to a global uh, optima, but in practice, for many of the problems in which they're useful, converging to a local minima is actually good enough. And you can do very interesting things where you can plan uh, trajectories for quadrotors that avoid obstacles and also take into account dynamical constraints very uh, well. All right, so now getting into task and motion planning. So the first task and motion planning system is probably Shaky the Robot, or I guess could be considered Shaky the Robot. And so this was a remarkable project done in the late 60s that spawned so many good ideas in both AI and robotics. So Shaky, right here on the right, was the first autonomous mobile manipulator. And what that means essentially is that Shaky could move around space and it also could technically manipulate the world by pushing things. It didn't have a gripper, but it could push these blocks around to different configurations. And the big algorithms that came out of this project were fundamental algorithms like the visibility graph, which is a motion plotting method that I didn't mention, A star search itself, and strips planning. And you can actually look at some of the predicates for the description of this domain, and it's pretty cool. They are very similar to the ones that you've likely seen this morning, and actually they even have continuous variables, technically. Although in reality, those are like handpicked waypoints by a human. Uh, so Shaky, while it does task planning and motion planning, doesn't do them simultaneously. It frames the problem as a hierarchical one, where it does task planning first, and then fixing the task plan will try to find motions that can execute it. So this works in some cases, but it also has a lot of failure cases. So what if Shaky was trying to move into this room over here, and there is this movable block in front of it? So the task plan doesn't have any uh, notion of geometry in it, and so it would think you could move directly to this room. However, it can't safely do that on the motion level, right? And so we'd have to report back to the task level that, okay, something's blocking it, and diagnose what's blocking it, and plan to rectify it. But that's not something that is actually present in this initial shaky formulation. And then even kind of on a more continuous level, how should you push it? Where should you push it? If you push it this way, it's still blocking the door. If you push it this way, maybe it's free. If you push it over there, maybe it's trapped in the corner and you can't re-push it. Maybe you can't re-achieve some sort of goal you need. And so these kind of decisions are really left as questions, and we need to design algorithms that can take them into account in order to be able to handle these kind of scenarios. So what do you have at the discrete level? So here it's basically just a standard uh, <laughs> strips problem. Uh, it's just a, like a blocks world-like thing is probably what you should imagine. But you don't have the x, y positions of the block? Uh, they have like names for the waypoints. But, so they, they do actually write down like numeric variables here, which is cool. But again, there are a finite set of them. So it's, you could rename them and it'd be equivalent, essentially. I, I guess my question was, yeah. why can't you know that if the block is in the way at the last level? How would you know that? I mean, you have the XY position. But, you know, maybe the robot could have gone around this way. It gets complicated pretty quickly. It's, it's a good point, though, yeah. So one could try to directly incorporate that by, maybe in the days of modern machine learning, trying to predict what actually is a precondition for this, and then maybe you'd identify the block is in the way. But, very quickly, and in particular when you get, with, get to planning for robot arms, it's less clear what's actually obstructing various things and the different pathways you could take to rectify that. And so by directly trying to do them both at the same time, you're only dealing with very concrete aspects of the state, and it's much easier to understand how they actually impact the planning problem. But to hammer this point home, so Shaky does decoupled task and motion planning, which is task planning and motion planning. <coughs> And really, this only works if you actually meet a very strong downwards refinability assumption. And this basically states that a problem is downwards refinable if every discrete plan you can come up with, so every possible strips plan, can be refined to low level, low level motions. And so in the previous case, that wasn't necessarily the case because we found a plan that involved moving to another room that actually does not emit a motion plan. And so at that point, we'd be stuck. We'd have no mechanism for trying to do something different. And that's where integrated task and motion planning comes into play. That if we instead reason directly about both the continuous and discrete state in some way, then we could hope to actually address those problems. 
to describe some of the complexities of doing task in motion planning, uh, first of all, it, it inherits the difficulties of both motion planning and classical planning. And so for motion planning, we're in these high-dimensional continuous spaces. And for task planning, we're dealing with many discrete variables in a very large discretized state space. And also long horizons, potentially. But also there's this added uh, set of constraints that deal with the fact that a lot of ge geometric and continuous constraints actually can limit the high-level strategies you can consider. And so in this case, things like reachability, which we just saw, things like kinematic limits, uh, joint limits, different grasps, that, which might actually be viable, they may influence what you're actually allowed to do. In this case, this is again our uh, PR2 in a kitchen-like domain. And let's say the task is to pour the water in the blue cup into something else. So the blue cup actually has an orientation constraint on it because we don't want to spill it. And so we can't actually take a top grasp of the cup. Because if we took a top grasp, then when we try to pour it, we pour on ourselves and electrocute ourselves. So we need a side grasp. But the green block is actually blocking a lot of the reachable side grasps. But the robot's not able to reach all the way around to grasp it. And so to solve this problem, the robot has to automatically decide to manipulate the green block to make room to grasp the blue block. And we can start to see the robot automatically planning for these things in a couple examples. So here's one again where we're trying to move the green block out of the way, and then we can do a successful port. And notice that once the material is no longer in the cup, it can flip it all around, doesn't care anymore. Here's one we're trying to pour into that bowl, and this is the exact picture I showed you before, where the robot will plan to move it out of the way. And this is all done on its own. I haven't told it what to do. It plans a very uh, nice suboptimal RT motion there. <laughs> That's okay. You know, it's not trying to run in a cost-sensitive mode for this example. Uh, and yeah, we can start to actually incorporate a lot of these constraints, again, for stacking-like challenges that involve pouring. And we can even start to incorporate them into pushing. So again, here's an example of one instance where the bull starts on the right side of the table and the robot just can't reach it immediately and it has to actually push it to the middle. And the reason the robot discovers this is because it knows what it's capable of doing. It can simulate different pushes, and once it's explored that space, it can say, oh, this one actually helped me. But it does take a lot of trial and error and sampling to actually come up with that plan. Our controller is doing some wonky things in some of these also. <laughs> That's why it collides with some stuff every once in a while. Because the planning is perfect. Planning is flawless, of course. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, didn't knock anything over. Wait till the end of my talk, then you guys will be laughing. And here's an example of it pushing something out of the way. It may not be the most optimal set of pushes, but it did the job, and now you can pour it. And yeah, everything got in the, the bowl, right? So actually, this, this project was done where we're trying to use learning to actually produce some of these manipulations. So it's really learning's fault for all the bad pours, not my fault, clearly. <laughs> it's my fault that things collide. Uh, here's another example of a task and motion planning problem that demonstrates some of the high dimensionality and long horizons that are present in many applications. So here the goal is to cook a meal for two. And so the meal today is a prepared cabbage, which are these green blocks. And so to actually make this meal, the robot has to uh, clean the cabbage by putting it on top of the dishwasher and then cook it by putting it on the microwave, which might be a little bit nonsensical, but for a college student, I guess it makes sense. Um, uh, there are some uh, pink radishes in the corner which actually obstructed the robot from initially retrieving the cabbage, and so the robot had to move them out of the way. And then because we want a tidy kitchen, there's a goal condition that they return to their initial configurations. And so if we break this down, we had to manipulate three cups and clean them. We had to clean and cook two of these green cabbages. This whole problem had 64 continuous variables and 10 purely discrete variables. There are collision constraints that prevent the cabbages from being directly grasped. There are discrete uh, sub-goals which require the robots to actually place things on top of the dishwasher and on top of the microwave. And only then can it serve a completed meal. And so this really does show off a bunch of very complicated behaviors that all can be solved by the same algorithm. Yeah? Sure. In configuration space, you're just a single point, right? And then yes. You, have, you blow up the objects with your. Yes. But then when I saw this, like you see, like his elbow coming pretty close to stuff. How do you have the So you can, um, a lot of collision checkers support returning the actual distance from an object. So you can say, okay, maybe I want to be a little bit safe and I want to say that my robot should not come within a centimeter of any obst obstacle in the world. And that becomes your new collision test. And so maybe it isn't directly in collision, but it's close enough where you consider it to be. And so you don't want to explore that part of the space. And in practice, I have to do that a lot because perception is not perfect, right? Like things might be off by about a centimeter. And so you want to be a little bit robust to that during your planning process. 
And my question was like, if you add the geometry, you add the yeah. geometry, like the whole R and the geometry. So actually, this is the great thing about sampling-based algorithms. So normally, you would have to add it, which is a very complicated geometric um, transformation, which is very much this kind of sliding effect along the outside of the object. By doing sampling-based planning, you implicitly represent that space. So you don't actually have to make it. You just have to test whether you're in the colliding part or not colliding part. And that's where you can get that test evaluated by just calling a collision checker. And so the picture in your head should be that that's what it's searching through. However, it's much easier because you just have to test whether it's in that part or not, which is very nice. Yeah, sweat volumes, again, are like very challenging to actually do in 3D. Um, here's another example that's actually a little bit subtle. Um, the task here is to take this block that's in this top right drawer and place it into the top left cabinet. And so to do that, it has to actually open the drawers and open the cabinet, of course. But as you see in the middle, it actually drops the block for a second. And that's because it can only actually pick up the block with a top grasp in the top right drawer. And it can only place it with a side grasp. But it can't get its arm high enough to actually put it down like that. And so the robot's automatically figuring out that this geometric constraint actually forces it to do an intermediate pick and place. And again, this comes out directly from being able to explore this space, which is really cool. Additionally, this uh, problem has some non-monotonicity. Non uh, and that means essentially that in order to solve this problem, you have to undo some goals in order to achieve some other goals. In this case, we have to open up the drawers and open up the cabinets in order to reach the block. And so that actually makes it very challenging to search through in many cases, because most heuristics are kind of adverse to undoing goals, essentially. Now we'll talk about the different approaches for doing task and motion planning. So I've kind of laid them out on a spectrum between how discrete they are and how continuous they are, where task planning is the most discrete and motion planning is the most continuous. And there are a couple <laughs> different uh, fields in the middle there. We'll start from the task planning side. So the easiest way of trying to apply classical planning to robots is to do as the follows, which is to pre-discretize the space. And so if you say, hey, human, can you tell me all the interesting placements of the objects, all of the interesting grasps, all of the, even maybe the can, robot configurations that can pick and place things, then the whole problem is finite, and then you could just solve it using existing classical planning techniques. Um, there is a little bit of a catch that oftentimes you still have to actually compute whether you can actually move between two configurations, so evaluate this reachability condition. And that's often very expensive to do. That, that, call, that requires calling like a motion planner itself to validate whether there's a safe movement from here to here. And as you saw with the PRMs, that might take over a second to do. And so if you have to do that for 100 different entities, then it becomes very expensive very quickly. However, we can start to actually apply what we learned about lazy motion planning to the task motion planning domain. So rather than try to compute every motion plan in batch up front, which may be computing things for computing plans, for instance, that like use the restroom when you're just trying to cook a meal, let's actually eagerly compute it during the search only, as that basically says, we're only going to evaluate whether something's reachable when we actually try the action. Or we can even adopt the lazy strategy, where we only actually check whether a motion plan exists after we've found a plan. And then in the event that we, everything is reachable along that plan, then we can return it as a solution. And if something isn't, then we remove that edge from the state space graph, and we replan. And like the uh, lazy motion planner, eventually that'll either uh, prove the problems infeasible, or it'll find a candidate plan, as you relax all the optimistic assumptions you've made about the problem. A different type of uh, hybrid planning that evolved from the uh, classical planning domain involves numeric planning. So this is planning where typically we have uh, a discrete state and also some numeric state variables, such as time, uh, energy, uh, fuel. And they evolve typically with either linear or polynomial dynamics. Um, sometimes people address nonlinear dynamics by discretizing time in these algorithms. And so they can model interesting systems like these, this battery right here, but they don't necessarily scale so well when there are like seven continuous degrees of freedom to plan with. However, they are much better than the sampling-based algorithms at inclu including or treating the real-valued variables very specially and their heuristics. And that enables them to be stronger and make the search much more efficient. There are some algorithms that actually do try to directly uh, plan uh, continuous controls. And you heard of some of them just a second ago, actually. Um, here, a lot of the approaches try to take your planning problem and first partition the space into a discrete set of regions. 
and then formulate uh, an optimization over a set of regions as a convex programming problem. And this is great because we have good algorithms for solving convex problems. Um, but this, these approaches may not scale so well as, again, the dimensionality of your space gets very large. However, in contrast to task and motion planning, these approaches do actually take into account dynamical constraints much more significantly. And so I think one avenue for future work is to think about how you combine these things to try to actually plan dynamics for high dimensional systems. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for overlap. So the non-convexity only comes from the, the geometry of the space and not from the... Primarily, yeah. So there could be other non-convex constraints, but you can tell that this is non-convex here by the fact that if you start with one plan here and you try to continuously deform it, it can't be done. So it's there are different like homotopic classes, is what people would call this in like motion planning uh, of solutions, and they cannot be continuously deformed, and so it's not convex. And so trying to explore all those classes is challenging. It has like a very combinatorial aspect to it. If you have nonlinear dynamics. Then. Yeah, so that would make it even harder, yeah. Like if you have an unreactuated system and you can't actually move in any direction, then even harder, yeah. But it means you couldn't like just partition it to make it you can partition the state space. You might not be able to actually solve and execute a sequence. Like maybe uh, you have a torque limit or something. You can't. There's gravity, and you can't move up this way. You can still formulate the problem of searching there and then try to solve it, but it may not be feasible. Yeah. So now, coming from the robotic planning community, naturally the way that roboticists have tried to tackle these manipulation problems is to extend motion planning. So namely, there's an insight that. Okay, when the, ro when the robot's manipulating things in the world, it's actually changing its geometry. That when I attach myself to this cup, now I have kind of this thing attached to my arm, and if I try to move this way, it'll collide with the table. And that's unsafe, be our definition. And so as the robot starts to pick and place things and push things and maybe uh, slide things on the table, it's actually changing the set of conf the configuration space that it can move through without colliding. And so naturally one can think about, okay, what if we try to plan for a sequence of these configuration spaces? And so essentially this is called multimodal motion planning, where each of these uh, configuration spaces is defined by a mode, and the mode includes things like whether the gripper is free, whether the robot's actually holding onto something, uh, whether, again, uh, you're attached to something you're pushing. And the nice thing about this is that then, kind of intuitively, we can just chain a bunch of motion planning problems together, and then we'll be able to have a solution for this problem. Unfortunately, there's a little wrinkle, and it's not quite that easy. Um, so we need to find configurations that are at the intersection of two configuration spaces. So concretely, if we're trying to pick and place this thing, we want to find a configuration in which the robot can then attach itself instantaneously and then move the object away from it. However, the set of values that actually satisfies that is often low dimensional. That when you restrict the robot to be grasping the object, then you're reducing the degrees of freedom that you can move around on your arm. And so now, you, what, where you start with like a seven-dimensional space, you might only have one degree of freedom you can manipulate, actually. And so if you try to then sample this set by just sampling uniformly at random through the seven degree of freedom space, then again, with zero probability, you'll actually get something that actually is in a grasping configuration. And so this is a problem. Um, and the way that people address this is to say, OK, we can't just brute force our way out of this. We have to understand something about the geometry of that space and that intersection in particular. And people develop ways for actually explicitly sampling values that do satisfy those conditions. And so for picking and placing, this is usually done using inverse kinematics, is that given a target and effector pose, we can actually then back out uh, a set of joint angles that actually reaches it. And there might be multiple, of course, if you have like several degrees of freedom left uh, unattached. But yes, yeah, so this is a, a key consideration that needs to be taken into account. Um, to maybe demonstrate this on a little bit more abstract problem. Suppose we're trying to plan from this configuration space to this one, so F1 to F2. And there is a configuration space in the middle that intersects them both. So F1 and F2 in this picture are both two-dimensional, but F3 is one-dimensional. And so to actually do this transition, we have to get on this line and then move through it, right? But if we tried to sample the space, again, uniformly at random, we'd have zero probability of getting on the line. And then even if we got on the line, we have to stay on it. So we have to understand something about the topology of this surface and the dynamics within it. But if we can actually put samples here and move through this line, then we can solve it using standard motion planning methods, honestly, which is great. And this type of behavior you know, even can be generalized to pictures in 3D, where we have the intersection of two modes that are two-dimensional in 3D space. 
And so care needs to be taken to ensure that you actually get those samples at that intersection. But once you can do that, then the algorithms are pretty easy, actually. So then all you have to do is sample a set of modes to consider. So maybe holding objects at different grasps, not holding objects, maybe pushing. Uh, for each of those modes, you uh, compute which ones are neighboring modes, so which ones you can actually move to, given that you start in one. And these are these uh, red arcs in the graph. Then you need to compute the uh, regions of the configuration space that actually allow you to transfer between each mode. And so in this case, again, our modes are two-dimensional, and the kind of intersection is uh, one-dimensional on the boundary in this cartoon. And so as long as you can sample from the boundary, you're in good shape. Once you've done that, you just sample within the modes and on the boundary. You connect everything up, and then, again, you have a nice finite graph, and you can do just any shortest path algorithm you like on. So really the key thing here is just understanding the intersection between these configuration spaces. Uh, so like how there's an extension of sampling-based methods to task and motion planning, there's also an extension of optimization-based methods to uh, task and motion planning. Uh, these are actually very related to the uh, methods we described before that actually partition the space. However, they, rather than formulating it as a partition and then a convex program, they directly formulate it as a uh, non-convex program and try to solve it approximately. Um, but the key thing here is that what we can do is we can pr provide a uh, discrete search over all the mode switches in our problem. And then each sequence of mode switches, which can be thought of like a partition, um, then defines a uh, uh, non-convex program. And then we uh, try to solve it. And then if so, then we have a solution. And so here's another uh, mathematical program describing this process. And here we have these mode switch constraints which hold just at the intersections of the modes, as well as constraints that must hold within each of the modes themselves. And these are like the standard trajectory optimization constraints revolving, involving torque limits and penetration. One thing to note, though, is that we oftentimes don't know a priori uh, the length of each of these sequences. That to solve a problem, we might have to just pick and place one thing, but maybe if it's buried in the back of a refrigerator, for instance, we'd have to move three things out of it. And so it isn't really clear how many uh, like mode variables you would need to create if you were trying to formulate it as a mixed integer program. And so there's a very natural planning component of this whole process to search over sequences of varying lengths in order to consider all the possible uh, trajectories you could take. Some other interesting work that's been done in this area is to actually try to solve approximations or relaxations of this planning problem to more efficiently prune things during your discrete search. Namely, you can take this very complicated mathematical program and just throw away like all of the motion constraints, which is valid. And then if you solve that optimally, then you have a lower estimate on the actual cost of your plan. But that might be very useful if you get a lot of information from, in particular, the kinematic constraints. Like if the key decisions in your problem are to decide where to pick and place things, and then you can say that, OK, let's just assume the robot moves in a straight line between each switch then that can actually give you a very good estimate of the ultimate path cost and can tell you very quickly that maybe something's a bad idea. If something seems very expensive with that relaxation, then you prune it from the search altogether. So finally, on, in terms of related work, uh, there's uh, integrated TAMP, which I'll define as planning that tries to treat both the discrete and continuous variables uh, with equal importance. But it's a very loose definition, honestly. Um, a couple of the methods that do this have some flavors to them. Um, the first are direct geometric searches through the multimodal space, so like multimodal motion planning. However, at each step, the uh, direction that you explore and even the direction that you might sample is guided by a classical planner that you can compute, given an abstraction of the state, the distance to the goal, and then try to bias towards states that actually seem closer to the goal, given your discrete state components. And then also, again, you can compute maybe a uh, preferred operators and then try to sample parts of your uh, control space that actually move you uh, to those regions. Other people have tried to actually uh, combine task and motion planning by developing a communication protocol to talk between the two of them. And so this kind of gets back to how do you report back to the task state what's going on. And if you can come up with some sort of program that sits in the middle and says, OK, the task planner gave me this discrete plan. This is what it means for the motion planner. And if the motion planner then can report back to the task planner what it did and what happened and maybe what went wrong, then you're in good shape. However, this is often pretty challenging to do. If you, know, if you think about trying to diagnose failures in the regrasp example I showed you, where we use the drawer and the cabinet, how would 
it's not really clear to a human initially like how you would actually say that that was the problem. And really, I think the difficulty from doing that is because you're operating with a different language, that they're inherently operating in very different descriptions because the task one is all logical and the geometric one is geometry. So other methods have tried to do a direct search in combined state space where discrete and continuous variables are treated identically. Uh, and this is going to be the remainder of my talk describing this set of, work, set of work. And I think this is nice because then you don't have to make up an interpretation of what the geometry means to the task level and vice versa. That they're both concrete and they're both entities in the world and have very uh, rigorous constraints defined on top of them. And just to recap, so this is the general uh, placement of these types of subfields with respect to whether they're discrete or continuous, and task and motion planning, and also numeric planning sit like finally in the middle. All right, so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to describe our approach to solving these problems called Stripstream. Stripstream is motivated by the insight that we've had a lot of good work in this space, but there aren't that many um, planning representations that can be used to model a variety of different environments or different robots or different manipulation skills. And it would be great if we could come up with some sort of interface or some sort of language that would be able to describe these and then admit algorithms for solving them in a general purpose way. And so to do that, we actually provide an extension of PDDL that incorporates sampling procedures. And these sampling procedures are nice because they allow us to enumerate possibly infinitely many uh, action instances. Again, we can consider placing uh, infinitely many proses on top of the surface. And by giving the planner a sampler, it's able to reproduce this set or cover that space. And then we hope to, to develop domain independent algorithms that can operate on these uh, PDL instances and samplers as black box inputs. So with no semantic understanding of what they do, just operating on the logical description of what they are and receiving outputs from Python essentially. Each of these algorithms will operate by solving a sequence of finite PDDL problems. And so this is great because then we can leverage any of the existing classical planners as search subroutines to efficiently solve any problems we create. And as a final note, some of our algorithms actually are particularly fast when the downward refinement principle holds. That if it is the case that your first set of decisions actually is likely to pan out, then they solve the problem immediately in like one iteration. And this is great because this gives us fast performance on maybe easier everyday problems while also uh, completeness on problems that are more challenging that we experience maybe less frequently. So I'll go through the language. Um, so we chose to extend PDDL uh, because everyone else is doing it first of all. Uh, it's basically the standard for an action language, right? Um, I think it's not necessarily critical for doing a lot of this work, but it's a very nice language to operate with it. And I think one thing that is very nice about a lot of the classical planning community is that they really do try to figure out representations of problems that are generic across many different domains. That you can have a language that can be used to encode uh, planning for a satellite, planning for elevators, planning for a bartender, and all in the same algorithmic framework. And that's something that the robotics community hasn't done nearly as much of in general. And again, by operating right on PDDL, we can then do sub-problems that can be solved with existing algorithms very efficiently. Finally, one point that's actually more useful for sampling-based methods that is less, maybe less apparent in general is that when you describe actions in a preconditions and effect model, you're really describing the difference between two states. You're saying what's changed. And so if you're picking and placing something, only a couple things change in time. The robot might change its configuration as it moves. It might pick up one object, but all the other objects remain at their current positions. And so to describe this transition by, as a delta, you can do it with many fewer parameters, which is nice, because you only have to specify the parameters involving the variables that are actually changing in time. While if you tried to write down all edges in the state space, then you'd have to consider all the possible pose combinations of everything else in the world. And that would be very intractable to ever describe very quickly. Yeah, so our goal is to try to solve, um, you know, using the same uh, algorithmic framework and algorithms, like very different domains and problems that involve different robots. Here's just one where it involves different robots. Uh, the task for both of these is to place the spam on the left or the tomato soup in the uh, cabinet or drawer. And the great thing here is that the core solver that planned for both of these is exactly the same. All that's changed is basically the description of the environment, so in robotics language, the ERDF of the robot and the environment, and some of the inverse kinematic procedures that are used to actually generate grasping configurations. 
And that's partially because this is actually a movable base, although it doesn't do it there. And so you have more degrees of freedom to play around with. Uh, as a motivating example throughout all this, we're going to use the following pick and place example. Um, here, there's a single goal object that prevents the blue uh, block from being grasped safely. And we have to move the red object out of the way. We're actually going to even go to a much simpler version just for concreteness, uh, so like a 2D domain. But the formulation we give basically will apply almost directly to 3D. It's just that the dimensionality of all the NumPy arrays associated is larger. But the kind of uh, logical level description of the domain is about the same. So here's our toy domain. It's a 2D pick and place example where the goal here is for A to be within the red region. The robot and blocks all have XY uh, poses. And so that XY is also the configuration of the robot. And currently, uh, B is obstructing A from being safely placed in the red region. And I guess finally, we have a robot vacuum gripper, so it can just attach itself in the, at the top of an object. So one solution for solving this problem involves picking up B, moving it somewhere else, picking up A, and placing it there. But note that actually there are infinitely many solutions, because the robot could have chosen to put B like anywhere over here, for instance, and A in many locations in the red region. The robot itself is really choosing these continuous variables. So to start with, we could try to model this problem as closely as possible using existing PDVL. So we could try to describe some initial facts that are true about the world, some static facts in particular. And so static facts are facts that are constant throughout time. So A is a block, uh, red is a region. Uh, a, when at 0, negative 2.5 is a grasp. Uh, Negative 7.55 is a robot configuration. So these are just descriptions of these objects. And really, what's a little bit different is that they're now NumPy arrays, but there's still a finite set of them for now. We also could describe the fluid part of the state, so what actually changes over time. And so that would be the robot configuration that it's currently at, whether the hand's empty or not, whether the robot's at, or whether an object's at a pose or not, and potentially whether the object's in a hand. And then finally, we need a goal formula to describe what we want out of this problem. And so we can use this little logical description where we want, uh, we want there to be a pose that the object A currently is at that's known to be contained within this region. And so something that satisfies the fluid predicate, fluid predicate of being at pose and the static one of being contained. Uh, we can even actually like, start talking about like, strips action descriptions. Uh, and the story hasn't changed so far. We can describe move actions. And so here's one where move action has a parameter for the initial configuration, Q1, the uh, trajectory taken, T, and the final configuration, Q2. And the precondition states that, OK, the robot has to be at Q1. And then after you execute this, the robot's now at Q2, and it's no longer at Q1. So very simple stuff. Um, the same thing for pick. We have, as an argument, the block being moved, the initial placement of the block, the grasp we want to use, and the robot configuration that can actually do it. And the state's updated accordingly, as you can see. But really the key thing here is that there are two static preconditions here, motion and kin, which involve all of the parameters of the actions, which govern what are valid values. Namely, if you want to do a sensible move action, you better expect that the trajectory you take actually has as its, in, as its initial configuration, Q1, and Q2 as its final configuration. You wouldn't want to like, operate on something that was like, you know, moving between two different configurations, or even moving on something that was a different type. Like, what if a, a string was passed into this action? That wouldn't make any sense at all. And so these preconditions actually restrict the set of valid instances that can actually be instantiated along the planning process. So suppose for now we were given uh, all these facts. Someone told you again that these are a bunch of interesting values, and these are the properties that they satisfy. Then the problem is trivial. It's just a breath first search. The state space is finite. We can just use any uh, strips planner we want, and explore the space. So here, here's our fluent subset of the initial state. And we start off, we take a move action, and we change the robot configuration to be from negative 7.5 to uh, 0, 2.5. We could explore another action over here. We can go between them. And we can even, we can even start to explore uh, picking and placing actions. And so really, once you have all of these static facts, the problem's pretty easy. All the hard work is done. We're, or, Hand it off to someone else, per se. <laughs> but that's the key challenge in task and motion planning. It's coming up with those values. Because generally, one doesn't want to uh, sit around with a robot and tell them how to hold a fork or something. Uh, so in this problem instance, we give it a couple values, though. 
Like it knows its initial configuration. It knows the initial poses of all the objects in the world. It knows how to grasp them even, maybe. But what the planner has to find is a pose for A within the red region, a collision-free pose for B that it can be moved to, four configurations for the robot that can actually do all the picks and places, and also some trajectories that move between them. So to start with, we can think about, OK, what samplers do we actually need to address these problems? And already we end up in a tricky shape, and this relates back to our discussion about lower dimensional intersections of configuration spaces. That if we describe a constraint like something is stably on something else, or in this case, something is contained within a region, we want the object to be uh, like squarely on top of it. And so in this case, have zero y value. But if we try to sample just directly through the set of poses, then again, if we sample uniformly at random, there's zero probability that we actually generate one that'll land on that surface, because we're sampling from a too high dimensional of space to actually achieve that goal. And so already we have to think a little bit about, OK, what's the underlying dimensionality of that space, and directly make procedures that can sample from it. And so in this case, if we're trying to sample placements of a pot on a stove, we have to understand that this is a surface that we can sample maybe a x, y, theta on top of, rather than sample six values. And additionally, uh, we might need arbitrarily many values to actually solve some of these problems. That there could be pathological examples where to solve the problem, the robot has to pick something, shift it, pick something, shift it, pick something, shift it, like arbitrarily many times that make it so you need arbitrarily many samples of placements. And so we better have a generator that can actually produce that. Hopefully we won't actually need to use them all, otherwise it's gonna take a while to plan, but being able to actually enumerate the set actually allows us to achieve completeness. Additionally, we have to think about not only constraints that are on their own low dimensional, but ones where you have there, we're considering intersections of constraints that further reduce the dimensionality. So in this case, we not only want like a pose that for the uh, pose for the uh, plot that's on the, the stove, we want to find then a robot configuration that can actually grasp it, right? And so here, both the placement and the uh, kinematic constraints are both dimensionally reducing. And so one way of it's kind of hard to directly produce that intersection, but one way of getting around that is to actually introduce something called a conditional sampler. And so in this case, it's a sampler that takes in as inputs some values, and then is able to produce as outputs uh, another value or multiple values that complete the tuple and satisfy the constraint. And so in this case, a natural example is our inverse kinematic sampler. So we take in the pose that we care about and the grasp that we want, and then we actually pass it to the procedure, and the procedure samples from the set of configurations that can actually produce the kinematic solution. And in general, these types of conditional constraints can be composed in an arbitrary manner as long as they are acyclic. That we can't have something that's an output of one feeding back in as an input of something upstream. But this allows us to chain together them. Like we can take our placement sampler and then pass its outputs to the IK sampler and then pass its output to the motion planner and then generate values that can satisfy all these constraints jointly. So a little bit more formally, uh, this is how we actually represent these uh, problems in our extension to PDL, via streams. So a stream here is a function to a Python generator. Uh, so really, it's just something that takes in again, some inputs, and outputs, enumerates a sequence of output values that are guaranteed to satisfy some properties. And so they, they are advantageous because you can define them programmatically. So like you can just use Python to write down uh, a sampler for placements on a surface. They also can be, again, infinite sequences. And by having inputs, they're compositional. And really, like all you need to describe them is something like this. So here is some Python syntax for a generator that takes in a function that returns a generator. It takes in three arguments, x1, x2, x3, and then just enumerates kind of a nonsensical infinite sequence in this case. But this is roughly the syntax you need, and that's sufficient to define your sampler. But these samplers, these streams alone, aren't really helpful yet. If someone just gives you a piece of Python code, like some spaghetti code, and doesn't tell you what it does, then how can you operate on it in any meaningful way? You have to have some sort of understanding about what do the inputs to this program mean? What do the outputs mean? And the good news is that you can actually convey all that information using the language of logic, which we're already committing to by doing things in PDDL. Namely, we can actually augment our Python procedures with a set of domain facts. So these are static facts on the set of valid inputs that can be passed to this program. 
So maybe if we have a motion planner, we only want valid inputs to be configurations and not poses, not names of objects, not uh, whole worlds themselves. So really these can be thought of as like type constraints. We want to ensure that the right things are propagated into the right streams. Additionally, and this is very significant, um, we can add certified effects, or certified facts. So these are facts that all the outputs and inputs of this program are guaranteed to satisfy. You're committing in your description of the domain to saying that this is a valid <coughs> blank. In this case, for our uh, post sampler, when we're generating placements on a surface, we can output that everything we generate is known to be a stable placement on the region we sampled from. And this is great because this connects up very nicely with our action descriptions because these domain conditions and these certified conditions are just uh, PDL facts. So concretely, here's an example of one of these for sampling placements on a surface. And so we take in as an input uh, a block and a region, and these are just the names of strings in this example. And we say we're going to output poses. And every entity that we output is going to be guaranteed to be a pose, and also a pose that's actually contained within region R. And when trying to describe the actual program to do this in 2D, it's pretty simple. Basically, you just query the intervals of the regions and the width of the block, and you sample uniformly at random from it, and you return the values you produce. And so given this little uh, snippet of Python code, you can actually start to plan in a continuous domain. Again, we can do the same thing for inverse kinematics. Um, IK is a little bit more tricky when you get to uh, high dimensional systems. So again, like seven degrees of freedom. And it's usually solved by either uh, solving it as an optimization problem or um, analytically solving for the set of solutions. Um, but in terms of its input-output specification, it's the same thing. We take in a block name, a pose, and a grasp, and we output configurations. And we guarantee that they're a configuration and that all of these values satisfy our kinematic constraint. And remember, this is the key a precondition of a pick action. And so by actually producing values outside of this, we can then start to think about picking and placing objects in the world. And again, we can do the same thing with the motion planner, uh, where inputs are one, a start configuration, end configuration, and it outputs a trajectory. And that trajectory certifies that that triplet actually makes sense as a move action. One thing that's slightly subtle uh, is that, as written here, uh, the motion planner can only incorporate static constraints about the world. So like joint limits and not movable objects. However, remember our world has a bunch of uh, movable blocks in it, right? And we need to ensure that the plans that we compute don't actually collide with those objects and then cause unsafe behaviors. Uh, one way of doing that would be to take all of our streams and add inputs that describe the current positions of everything in the world, effectively. But again, if you have 10 objects in the world, then you have maybe 10 inputs. And you have, like, let's say again, like two to the 10 possible combinations of things to try, which blows up in your face very quickly. However, what we can do to combat that is to actually introduce collision checking as a precondition of the actions themselves. So namely, for our place action, which is in our 2D domain the only way we're going to collide, at least when placing an object, or when manipulating an object, we can define a precondition that the placement that we want and the object cannot be unsafe currently. Here, unsafe is something called a derived predicate, which is basically a logical formula defined on other uh, facts about the world. And so in this case, our derived predicate is unsafe. And it says that, OK, block one, if placed at P1, is unsafe if there exists another block at another pose. That's not the first one, of course. Um, that's not collision free. And here, this is C free. Alternatively, if that is in collision, it would be also fine. And so the good news here is that um, you have to, in order to use a place action, you have to actually prove that something is not in collision in order to ensure that you're not doing something unsafe. And to actually do this checking, you can introduce a stream that evaluates whether two placements are in collision. This is a special type of stream that I call a test stream. And so it's a stream that has no outputs. And so it basically just returns true or false, depending on if the inputs satisfy a condition. And it takes in uh, two object poses and returns true if they're not in collision, so these guys, and false if they're in collision. And this is great because our algorithms will have to then reason about proving these facts in order to be able to use uh, pick and place actions. Yep, so this is the representation. Um, so strip stream. 
Again, it's uh, strips plus streams. Um, and here, the components that a person using a system will need to specify are first, the domain dynamics. And this could be a standard PDL domain file with no modification, so just the descriptions of the actions you care about. Maybe the functions and predicates of the world, and also dry predicates if you use them. Um, what we add is a stream.pdl file, and this is where we uh, encode those stream descriptions, so this syntax I showed you here. And really, this is just declaring some properties about the Python programs you're going to pass in. Like, what do they take in? What do they take out? And finally, we need a description of the initial state and the goal condition, as well as an implementation of the streams. And so in our case, we actually allow the initial state to be specified in Python because it usually contains some objects that aren't strings. Again, we're dealing with NumPy arrays, and it'd be kind of tedious to have to name all of those arrays and then pass them to something else. But yes, yeah, so the user essentially provides these three things. They get consumed by our algorithms, and then the algorithms will, if it's feasible, find a plan. And if they find a plan, also produce a set of facts that are guaranteed to support that plan, like a certificate that it's correct, essentially. But again, the key thing is that the streams here are an input, and the planner does, doesn't know anything about their internals other than what's specified in the stream.pdl file. So now we'll talk about algorithms. Again, so I'll, we're going to talk about two strip stream algorithms. Uh, both of these are going to alternate between uh, sampling different values by querying these streams and solving certain problems that are resulting from the discretization that you produced. And so we'll have a phase where they sample and we'll have a phase where they create a finite PDDL problem and try to solve it. And then upon seeing a solution or not seeing a solution, they'll modify the problem to try something new on the next iteration. And again, a key advantage of this is that the search can be implemented using an off-the-shelf algorithm. And so actually, in all of my algorithms, I use fast downward directly as a subroutine. And that allows me to get very good search performance in some of these more challenging domains in particular. And one thing you can show is that uh, the algorithms are actually promised to be complete uh, when applied to TAMP if you give them samplers that actually appropriately cover the spaces that they are sampling from. So if you're providing a sampler that's sampling uniformly at random, then it's going to cover the full space and you'll be able to, with high probability, find a solution. The first algorithm is pretty straightforward, but it's good to go through anyways. Um, so maybe the one way of interpreting the whole stream business is that they provide a mechanism for trying to enumerate the full initial state of the world. That by generating these certified facts, they're trying to enumerate all the things that are true about the world without ever overwhelming you because you're enumerating an infinite set of things. And so one way of trying to do that uh, execution is to actually query the streams and compose all ones that have valid inputs, and then periodically just take the resulting problem that you currently have, try to solve it, and if you find a solution, then you're done, which is good, and if not, you just evaluate more things. So it's pretty simple. It's this small state machine. So you start off, you call fast downward. Uh, let's say there's no plan, so we'll sample some values, and we'll repeat. And we just keep doing this until we, get, we solve the uh, problem. Yeah, so now we have a complete algorithm for solving these problems, but as we'll see in a second, it maybe doesn't feel that interesting or that effective. But we'll walk through it. Uh, so let's say we're doing this problem, and again, um, on the first iteration, let's say we sample two new robot configurations that can pick up the object at, well, each object at its initial, uh, initial pose. And we can sample some new poses for the objects, some that are in the gray region, some in the red region. And we can make a couple of degenerate trajectories that kind of move from the initial configuration to themselves. All right, so now we have a finite set of samples and behind the scenes, a finite set of facts associated with them. So we can pass it to fast downward uh, and it'll try to solve it. And clearly there aren't enough samples at all because you can only move to your current location. So it'll fail, but that's okay. We'll try again next time. So maybe on the next iteration, we'll try to actually find configurations that can pick up objects at each of these poses. <laughs> so now this is getting pretty good. Now we can actually place objects at the final locations we just sampled. We could sample some new poses. Maybe we didn't need them, but we don't know that yet. And we can start to actually move around to new configurations. However, we can't actually move to this configuration, for example, which, which is one in which block B would be safely placed out of the way of block A. Uh, yep, so we pass it to fast downward, and again, it proves this problem is infeasible. And actually, a lot of these proofs are done very quickly by calling admissible heuristics and finding out that they have infinite value. 
So sometimes it doesn't actually take that much time to actually say, okay, you don't have enough. And actually this process could repeat for two more iterations, resulting in call, uh, calling the streams 182 times, but eventually you get a solution. And again, this is one that I just picked out of my Python program that has some you know, kind of funky values, but that's because it's sampled uniformly at random. Um, but of course, one would hope that we could do something better given that we have all this infrastructure set up for describing these domains. And in particular, um, really the key problem is that we're generating so many unnecessary samples. Like, we, we didn't need to move block B many more times, we just need to move it once. And these samples are expensive to generate because we're actually doing things like inverse kinematics and motion planning at each step. And so it's even more expensive than it is in the, just the motion planning case. And additionally, as you make more samples, your discretized planning problem gets larger and it makes fast hours uh, life harder as well. And so it's good to try to keep the number of samples you uh, need, or you grow, to be very few. And the way that we're going to do this is really just to uh, apply this idea of lazy planning, again, from motion planning, to task and motion planning. One key caveat, though, is that unlike in the discretized case, we're actually going to optimistically plan to generate hypothetical outputs because we need to think about potential samples that we could make without actually creating them. So namely, given that we have our stream descriptions, you can say, okay, I have a procedure that hypothetically could give me a placement of an object, and then, okay, so I can make a fake sample for it. I haven't actually called the Python program yet. I'm just saying, this might work. You can actually pass that into other streams and generate other hypothetical samples. So, if I made a pose, then I could actually potentially find a configuration that allows me to grasp it. And then this goes on, and you can actually make hypothetical trajectories that all well, that move between the configurations. And again, all of this is done for ever calling a stream, ever actually sampling any real values. But this is really helpful because this gives you an understanding of all the capabilities that you possibly could do given the streams that you have. And so this is the basis of the second algorithm, which is the more efficient of the two by far, called the focused algorithm. And again, the idea is to apply lazy planning to this domain, and it repeats this process, where essentially you fake call all these streams by creating these optimistic placeholder values. You do a discrete search to see if it emits a plan. If your plan comes back and you have no optimistic values on it, you've like, actually sampled everything, then you're done. Solution. But usually it's not that easy. Uh, then. If you do have values on it, you have to actually try to sample some bindings for them. So given that I hypothetically thought about producing this pose, I need to actually now try to produce a real one by calling the underlying Python program. And once done, then you can report back to the problem, okay, I've discovered some new values that certify these facts, um, but you also need to do something to prevent the search from doing the exact same thing on the next iteration. Namely, all of the streams that you query that support the uh, arguments on your plan, you disable. So basically you say, okay, on the next iteration, I'm not going to let myself produce any more of these. And by not producing any more of them, then fast downward can't return a plan that incorporates them. So you have to try something else. And so this is very useful in particular if there's maybe a, let's say, a, a plan produced that just isn't feasible at all. You could never produce values that satisfy it. This mechanism will force you to try other things and ensure that the resulting process is a complete algorithm. And we'll go through two examples of this. Uh, to start with, to Make it a little bit easier. Let's pretend that object B is gone. Uh, so we're just we just we just have to place object A in the red region. So we can create our optimistic values. Again, they're all denoted by uh, this pound or hashtag prefix, depending on how old you are. Um, and the natural plan that one would want is to move the uh, robot to a place to pick the object, and then move it to the actual goal location uh, on top of region uh, the red region. And so the set of constraints that we haven't proven that support this plan involve uh, two kinematic constraints uh, resulting from picking and placing the object, two motion constraints, and a constraint that the ultimate placement is in the red region. And so given that, we can back out actually a directed acyclic graph of all of the streams we need to evaluate to try to bind values for this plan. And namely, what that entails is, again, sampling from the region to try to find a value for P0. And once you have that value, you can sample an uh, inverse kinematic solution to find a configuration of the robot to stand. And then you can actually do the same thing for its initial pose. And then finally, you can actually compute motion plans between all the configurations involved. And so if everything works out, then you're just done, essentially. You have a binding for all these variables, and you've solved the problem. 
And this is actually an instance of a problem in which the, the downward refinement assumption actually does hold. That really the first thing we thought of has a nice binding for a solution. However, our motivating example was a little bit harder than that, right? We had block B in the picture. And so if we try this problem again, what we can do is we'll find a solution that involves moving, picking, moving, and placing again. So only four actions. Um, and we'll write down the set of the constraints. And because we have block B in the world, we have this additional collision-free constraint that we need to ensure that whatever place we put A, so again, uh, P0 is A, it doesn't collide with B's current placement, or its initial placement, I guess. Um, so then, OK, we can back out the directly acyclic graph that produces this. And so we can sample placements for A again. That's not so hard. But because B is squarely in the center of this region, there are no placements of A that actually can be put there without colliding with B currently. And so this will fail. This will return false. And so now the key question is what to do next? Um, that we'd hate to do the exact same thing again, right? And that's why we need to actually report back to the search that, OK, we tried this thing and it failed. And we have a mechanism for actually then incorporating that to prevent it from trying to make another sample of A that might collide with B in this region. And so we failed. And we have proven that there's a pose, but we haven't proven that's a collision-free pose. So on the next iteration, because we've removed the ability for A to generate a collision-free pose in this region, and this is all done automatically, just via the descriptions of the actions, or the streams, we're forced to find a plan that actually uh, first picks up B, moves B to somewhere else. That's not quite bound yet, but it, hypothetically, there could be a place where B could stand that would actually not be in collision. Then picks up A and places A in the goal region. And so if you retrace the graph of this, here. Now we start by trying to sample a placement for object B in this gray region. So that could be over here, here, here. And then because B is in this new placement, the one we computed on the last iteration that was for A right here might not be in collision with the new placement of B. That B might be over on this side of the world instead of in its initial configuration. And if everything pans out well, then we can actually produce samples that satisfy all of these constraints and solve the problem in this iteration. If not, then we can repeat. Uh, and we have a mechanism for always reintroducing these samplers to be reconsidered in the event that we keep failing over and over again. And we did some uh, scaling experiments to see uh, how much this uh, benefits you uh, on a bunch of pretty uh, large problems. Um, what we found is that the focused algorithms can solve these problems in about 20 seconds, while the incremental one uh, either takes longer or doesn't solve it within over two minutes. And I think two minutes is probably a long time for a robot to be solving these things, so it seems prohibitive. All right, so I have a little bit of time left. So I'll discuss some extensions that actually start to um, integrate with some of the other uh, work that's being presented at this, uh, uh, this speaker series, I guess. Um, so one thing that we've said so far is that we've stuck to planning for uh, a single uh, robot in the world. However, of course, there's a lot of great work in multi-robot planning. So one thing we can do immediately is we can try to plan for a team of robots that all uh, that do not move simultaneously, right? And that's what's being shown here. And we can even uh, accomplish tasks like the extension of a classical rover's domain from PDL, where you have to actually take photographs of different entities in the world and pick up rock samples. And we can uh, solve them using the algorithms we presented already, um, just by essentially having actions that, to move each robot independently. Of course, if we have a multi-robot team, we'd hope that they don't have to wait for each other to move, right? That they can move at the same time. And this really does get into temporal planning, which you saw a decent amount of today. So one thing that we could try to do is say, OK, so if, we, if our algorithms currently work with an existing classical planner, if we want to do temporal planning, what if we try to use a temporal planner as our search subroutine? And so concretely, like swapping fast downward for temporal fast downward, which is a temporal planner. Then we could actually solve motion planning problems like this one, where the goal here is for these two turtle bots to swap initial poses. And the planner is actually able to identify a plan that keeps them moving simultaneously, but actually keeps them, on the keeps them out of collision at the same time. And really, when trying to specify the new uh, domain file for this application, it's very similar to the temporal planning specifications you've likely seen so far. Um, Really, the only the key challenge here is that, well, first of all, um, 
The duration of the action is a function of the distance traversed. And again, we might be sampling from trajectories of different lengths. Well, that's not too bad. We just have a function that evaluates that. However, when we want to act in the world, we want to ensure that while each robot is moving, that they don't collide with each other when in the process of moving along a trajectory. And that's this not unsafe trajectory precondition set here. And additionally, um, as an effect, so when the robot starts executing this move action, it now is on the trajectory. And while it, it's in the middle, that predicate is true. But when it reaches the end, it's no longer true. And really, the key challenge is, again, what happens if maybe the start and end points of these two motions are safe, but they might collide in the middle? For instance, in this example, if they start moving at the same time, they possibly could hit uh, at the center. And we hopefully would want one of them to slow down first to let the other one pass before the other one could then resume its uh, trajectory. So this is a little bit challenge challenging to model directly because the planner doesn't know at each point in time where the robot necessarily is. It knows that it starts somewhere and ends somewhere, but everywhere in the middle is kind of gray area uh, in terms of a temporal plane. So one conservative thing you could do is you could try to say, OK, this uh, sequence, this set of trajectories is unsafe if there exists any pair of configurations on them that's in collision. And so we can sample a bunch of configurations and then check the pairs. And it turns out that, of course, the ones in the middle actually are colliding. And so thus, this action can be deemed unsafe. Uh, and then we can make an analogous derived predicate that represents that it's unsafe, essentially. And this basically says that this trajectory is unsafe for robot R1 if there exists another robot in a trajectory such that the other robot's moving along that trajectory, and that trajectory is in a collision with the one that we want to do. And so this might seem a little bit too conservative, um, and that if we can't move these long distances, then all we're going to get out of this is that one stops, and the other one does the full trajectory, and then the, like R2 then starts its trajectory. However, as you uh, decrease the length of each movement action into separate actions, the planner can actually start to keep track of where things are more finely in time. And so then you can get very good performance as you sample more and more uh, edges in the world, essentially. And we can even start to uh, build on this to incorporate uh, numeric variables, such as, in this case, charge. So this is an example where the robots have to recharge their solar cells by stopping for a little bit. And every action actually drains some of their charge. And the great thing here is now we get to actually start to integrate in a lot of the good algorithms for solving numeric planning problems uh, with <laughs> the uh, ability to handle con like very high dimensional continuous domains with sampling that our algorithms provide. And the specification for these is basically the same as you would do for a normal numeric planning problem. So finally, uh, in the real world, our robots you know, can't move perfectly and they can't observe their state perfectly. And we currently have not addressed that. And if we want to actually hope to ever have them do anything real, we have to start to think about it. Uh, and so immediately, if we start to relax our assumption that our action effects are deterministic, we realize that we're in a uh, hybrid Markov decision process. So basically there, uh, each action has a distribution over the possible consequences of it, rather than just one effect. And because of that, if we're trying to execute some sort of plan, we might land in a state that we didn't intend to land in. We'd have to then react to that change in plans. And so we need a policy, which is a mapping from a state to an action in each state in the state space. Uh, so solving these problems already is challenging enough when solving them deterministically. Uh, trying to solve them with stochastic effects and, and in a complete offline manner is thought to be intractable, although maybe one of you guys finds a good algorithm for doing it at some point. Um, so we're going to try to address this problem by, instead of completing, computing the policy offline, computing it online in real time by replanning, which is a very sensible thing to do. So every time that we arrive at a state, We'll compute a new plan, and that'll tell us where we should go. And we'll actually even make a more substantial approximation for solving these problems, something called action determinization. So this is a transformation of the original stochastic problem that actually removes the stochasticity by letting the planner choose what, which effect each action has. And so really, it's a reduction to a deterministic planning problem. Uh, so this is a, can be a very strong approximation, particularly if you're in a very probabilistically difficult domain where if you mishit the button, you blow up the world or something. However, if you're in a robot planning domain where the worst thing that can happen is you drop your block and you have to pick it up again, it's not too big of a deal. And there are some strategies for trying to add in behavior to keep the uh, planner risk averse by considering the costs of actions and waiting them to incorporate the likelihood of the effect that you select. 
And then additionally, of course, uh, the other assumption we need to relax is full observability. Um, in general, we only have limited sensory capabilities. Our sensors are noisy. Um, and so now we're in a hybrid, partially observable Markov decision process, or POMDP. The good news, though, is that uh, a well-known result in POMDP literature is that you can reduce a POMDP to an MDP defined on a belief state. And here, a belief state is a distribution over all the possible states you can be in. And so if we have an algorithm for solving MDPs, and that algorithm can support operating on uh, probability, probability distributions rather than just single point estimates, then we have a POMDP algorithm, potentially. And here, there's been some work that deals with this, and it tries to handle the case where maybe um, your belief representation is via multivariate Gaussian distribution, or maybe using a particle filter or something. And we've started to actually extend our uh, framework and apply it to these types of partially observable domains. So as a final example, this is one where the robot's goal is to believe that the green block is on the blue table. And so the first thing it does is it actually moves to the blue table and hopes that the green block is on it, because that's like the least costly thing to do. However, it gets no observation, so then it adjusts its belief and no, long, no longer thinks that it's likely on the table. And then it scans the red one and eventually scans the white one. And then it says, OK, now I've localized the block. I can pick it and then move it to the goal location. Um, yeah, and so you get these really interesting behaviors coming out of this. And you can even incorporate these visibility constraints within the geometric world. Like one thing that our PR2 robot, which is the one right here, suffers from a lot is that many times its uh, movements uh, actually obstruct its vision. And it has very bulky arms. And so if you try to pick something up and carry it like this and you can't see the world, then you might actually be colliding or misdetecting. So incorporating that geometric information while planning is very crucial. And we've started to be able to apply this to our robot in the real world. Uh, and this is basically the same version of uh, the task I just showed you, but uh, again, in the real world. Um, here, the goal is to believe that the green block is on the right table. And so initially, the robot scanned the room and detected a bunch of planes representing the services that it can interact with. Then it has a, well, actually, so first, it does visual object detection on the right or left um, to just determine what each thing is in the world. And so in this case, this is a table and this is a block. Then that, goes, that is sent to a point cloud-based method, which estimates the plane, and a point, cl uh, point cloud-based method, which registers a position and orientation of each object. And that's fed into the planner, which is then able to plan a sequence to hopefully achieve the goal. All right, and so that's the end of my talk. Uh, here are some brief takeaways about what I discussed today. So I mean, the most important thing is just what, what is TAMP? Um, so, Task motion planning is hybrid planning, in particular where continuous and geometric constraints can influence your high-level decisions. So again, think about things obstructing your motion, uh, think about reachability constraints, et cetera. Sampling is a very powerful way for trying to explore many of these continuous spaces. It's both important for motion planning and also for task and motion planning. We have to sample other variables. We introduced our framework that allows you to model uh, task and motion planning problems in a domain-independent way by incorpor incorporating uh, sampling procedures as black boxes through streams. We have domain-independent algorithms for solving these problems. And again, this lazy slash optimistic planning allows you to very intelligently choose which sampling procedures are actually helpful for trying to solve the problem. Uh, we have code for this online if you want to play around with it. And there'll be a lot more things made available shortly. And of course, that we're trying to extend this to other types of planning and to build off great ideas in multi-agent, probabilistic, and partially observable planning. All right, so thank you. And here is a video of outtakes of the robot when trying to make some of the demo videos. <laughs> so, enjoy. <laughs> So uh, we have a break now, so if you want to ask questions, come here please, and we start again at 4.30 for the lab.